Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. So I think as many, uh, many of us know, uh, one of the real success stories in, in breast cancer and uh, in terms of personalized medicine, in terms of tailoring therapies to a particular uh, subtype of breast cancer uh, has been the story with HER2. Uh, you know, we know that about 20% of breast cancers have amplification of the HER2 gene, uh, which leads to dramatic overexpression of the HER2 protein, and this has been, uh, you know, clearly an example in which we know that it's this particular genetic alteration that drives these cancers. We know in the laboratory uh, that if you block HER2, uh, that these cancer cells uh, are no longer oncogenic. Uh, and we now know in the clinic, with first with trastuzumab, uh, and then with uh, lapatinib and, and pertuzumab, and most recently TDM1, uh, that blocking this HER2 protein uh, or targeting this HER2 protein leads to clinical benefit. Uh, the most recent uh, examples of this have been the updated results of the uh, Cleopatra trial. Uh, this was a trial that randomized patients with HER2-positive metastatic disease in the first-line setting uh, to either docetaxel, trastuzumab, and placebo, uh, or docetaxel, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab. Um, and the addition of this new monoclonal that targets HER2 uh, led to uh, pretty dramatic improvements in survival. So Sandy Swain uh, just presented the data um, uh, at the end of 2014. Uh, this showed almost a 16-month improvement in overall survival with the addition of this second monoclonal antibody. So again, I think that that's you know, really uh, compelling uh, evidence that identifying a specific target and blocking it, uh, in this case with two different uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, can lead to real uh, clinical benefit. Um, the other recently developed drug is uh, trastuzumab imtansine, or what we commonly call TDM1, um, which has shown uh, significant improvements in progression-free survival and overall survival in the second-line setting uh, compared to capecitabine lapatinib, uh, and uh, improvements in progression-free survival in third and later-line settings compared to treatment of physici physician's choice. Um, the data that's going to come out uh, at ASCO this year is from the Mary Ann study, which is looking in the first-line setting. Uh, in the past, we had a phase two trial that looked at uh, TDM1 compared uh, to ataxane and trastuzumab in the first-line setting, and that did show improvement in progression-free survival uh, with TDM1 compared to chemotherapy and trastuzumab. Um, and in addition, TDM1 was better tolerated. So I think people were very excited about moving uh, TDM1 into the first-line setting, uh, and, and that was the premise of the uh, Mary Ann trial. In Mary Ann, uh, patients uh, were randomized to a control arm of taxane and trastuzumab versus TDM1 placebo or TDM1 plus pertuzumab. The reason to combine pertuzumab and TDM1 is the same uh, rationale uh, in Cleopatra in which there was clear synergy between trastuzumab and pertuzumab, uh, so it made sense to also look to see if there was synergy between pertuzumab and trastuzumab imtansine, since again that was a trastuzumab-based regimen. Um, so I think many of us were surprised and disappointed uh, to find uh, the recent results from Marianne, um, which showed uh, that TDM1 uh, plus placebo or TDM1 uh, plus pertuzumab, neither were superior uh, to the control arm of trastuzumab and ataxane. And that may be because trastuzumab and ataxane is a very effective regimen in the first-line setting, um, but again, I think it, it was a little bit surprising to not see superiority. On the other hand, uh, both of the TDM1-containing arms were not inferior uh, to trastuzumab and ataxane. Uh, but since right now, at least in the United States, uh, the standard of care for most patients in the first-line setting is not trastuzumab plus taxane, but it's trastuzumab and pertuzumab and taxane, um, you know, I, I don't think that the Marianne data are going to change uh, the uh, current standard of care. I think given the, uh, the really impressive survival benefit seen uh, with trastuzumab and pertuzumab, uh, in the first-line setting, that, that really should remain the standard of care, uh, and TDM1 uh, remains the standard of care in the second-line setting. So, you know, from a scientific uh, stand standpoint, I think 
many of us were disappointed with the Marianne results, and I think we need to stop and, and uh, try to uh, explore the details of that trial to try to understand why there wasn't superiority there. Um, but at least from a patient standpoint, the standard of care really hasn't changed uh, from these results. You know, we, we've had huge advances in the treatment of HER2-positive disease uh, during my career. I mean, it's been unbelievable, I think, really. Uh, represents about 25% of breast cancer patients in the early stage setting and a smaller percentage of metastatic disease, uh, mainly because trastuzumab has been so effective in curing many women who wouldn't have been cured previously from early stage breast cancer. But even with that, we've been able to show a huge survival advantage with pertuzumab in the Cleopatra trial, first line metastatic setting, and we're waiting with bated breath to see the adjuvant data with the affinity trial with pertuzumab. We have a new agent with uh, TDM1 uh, that you know, is a sort of targeted uh, toxin. Uh, and uh, that drug, of course, is approved as in later line metastatic setting, you know, being studied a lot in the early stage setting. But the Marianne trial suggests that it's not going to be as good as uh, trastuzumab and uh, taxane because when you add pertuzumab to it, it wasn't better than trastuzumab and taxane in the Marianne trial. So, you know, uh, where we're going with that in the early stage setting, you know, we're, we're studying uh, TDM1 in low risk stage one disease, I think very interesting because then you don't lose your hair and, you know, maybe it has some advantages. Uh, but we're still casting about to what to do. You know, we had at ASCO 2015 some data on, you know, PI3 kinase maybe being a marker of response to mTOR inhibition. And we know that there are markers that predict worse outcome, but we don't know how to target them. You know, if you look at pertuzumab, it doesn't give you a selective advantage in that group of patients, but neither does TDM1, et cetera. So what could we do in these patients? We've been searching for that. Seeing the data from the Extinet trial, I think, gives us some food for thought about whether or not we're moving in that direction. So the Extinet trial studied neratinib, uh, the most potent oral uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor that blocks HER2 and, to some degree, HER1, so a multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, and that drug has met with some difficulty in the metastatic setting, mainly because of tolerance. You know, the drug was given without any preventive diarrheal therapy, and it causes diarrhea in the majority of patients by far. And then it, it's funny because unlike some other drugs, like pertuzumab, which cause a lot of diarrhea, it caused diarrhea right away so that people would stop early or hold the drug or dose reduce. And so I think one of the reasons why the metastatic trials maybe didn't show as good a results as we thought they should have is because you know people couldn't tolerate the drug. But in the Extinet trial, you're treating a different group of patients. These are patients who completed one year of adjuvant trastuzumab and largely received anthracycline and taxane-based chemotherapy. And then they were randomized to either receive a year or not or of neratinib or placebo. And partway through the study, a greater in, uh, understanding of how to manage diarrhea came about, and people really were managed more effectively, even though they weren't routinely prophylaxed, which is the standard right now. But if you prophylax, you can have the rate of diarrhea in these patients. Uh, so it really makes a big difference. I mean, it's similar to the way we manage the toxicities of Everolimus. You know, now we're going to give steroid mouthwash. We're not seeing the stomatitis. So I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind. But so if you're treating this group of patients who have early stage disease, uh, the patients who were treated on the Extinet trial in the first 700 odd patients, it included stage one breast cancer, so no negative disease. And there wasn't a, you could have had a pathologic complete response to neoadjuvant chemo. We know a good prognosis group and still be enrolled. After 700 odd patients, a little under 800, they changed the trial to eliminate stage one patients who had no negative disease and also those patients who had a pathologic complete response. Really important change because that meant that in their trial, which had over 2,000 patients in it, they had the largest number of patients had at least stage two breast cancer and no path CR. So that's very helpful. So they actually had a press release last year saying that the patients who received neratinib had a better two-year uh, disease-free survival. It's important to think about the endpoint of this trial. Because the, the drug hadn't worked as well as they had hoped in the advanced setting, I believe, uh, they uh, changed the trial endpoint to not be a long-term one, 
but to basically say we're going to make or break. You know, if we don't have a benefit of two years, we're done. So the end point was two years. Well, now they have a benefit of two years. Of course, they've extended it out, so they'll get five years, and we'll know what happened over time. And that's going to be really important, too, because you know the, the long-term data with trastuzumab has been very important for us to understand the impact of that drug. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, and now, finally, we've seen the data from Extinet, which is great. No difference in what we expected in terms of the toxicity, uh, but an improvement in disease-free survival at two years in the population as a whole. Now, the improvement is really tiny in the population as a whole, so maybe not enough in that patient population for most people to give a year of a drug where you have to prophylax against diarrhea. You know, these it's important to think about it. The patients at a year out, they are done. You know, they want to be done. And uh, they, you know, feel like you know, you've said to them, oh, great, you have herd positive disease. Your chances of being cured are great. And so then you're going to say to them, now we want you to take a pill where you're going to be still a patient and have side effects and need blood tests for a year. So the overall population disease-free survival is very, very small. Uh, but what's intriguing is they were able to look at uh, the differential benefit in ER positive versus ER negative disease. And they had a lot of patients in the ER positive subset. It was a little more than ER negative. So not quite 60%, you know, somewhere around 57% in the ER positive group. And in those patients, the difference was over 4%. And that's considerable. I think a clinically meaningful difference for us. So then you have to go back and say, so what does that mean for us in the clinic population? So we're seeing this difference. Now, you want to look then at the forest plots, right? You want to look at does it make a difference who the, you know, what the patient had or not. And it's really hard to know because in this first presentation of the data, we don't have all the breakdown in the, the 57 or so percent of patients who had ER positive disease. So we're going to have to see that going forward. But we know that the trial selectively enrolled patients who had node positive disease and didn't have a path CR. So, and they were able to find a lot of those patients. So I think that you know, if the drug is available to us, that where we would consider using neratinib is in patients who have high risk ER positive breast cancer. And that is a tough population for us. These are patients who relapse late. And you know, if we could prevent the late relapse in these patients, that would be fabulous. Maybe it's the overlap of neratinib and hormone therapy that's so critical in those patients. And I think another question that comes up is, so we're extending treatment for another year. The next thing we should do is add the neratinib to the pertuzumab and trastuzumab. Let's say affinity is positive, and we're going to give pertuzumab now for a year. Maybe if you add neratinib, we're going to further reduce the risk of recurrence. That's, of course, another trial question. But, you know, it's just my guess that if it turns out to be safe to give that triple combination, that people may start the neratinib early so that they shorten the duration of time you get the treatment. But, you know, I really think that uh, there is a group of patients who have ER positive, very high risk HER2 positive disease, particularly, and we do a lot of neoadjuvant therapy, particularly those who have disease after neoadjuvant therapy, where neratinib uh, really, I think, will play a big role. I, you know, I like to tease out the group of patients who don't have a bad CR who have ER negative disease to know whether neratinib has the same impact in that group of patients because it may be that what's happening in the ER positive group is you're just picking out the higher risk group even more so by looking at ER positivity. And then of course there's interest in you know, this idea of combining neratinib with pertuzumab and trastuzumab, it will be studied, uh, we hope, in uh, an iSPY type neoadjuvant trial uh, along with chemotherapy and that will be fascinating. I mean, if we could you know, really uh, first identify the group of patients who need more and then treat them with this kind of therapy where you know, the appeal is you have two antibodies now, now you want something different that really comes at this uh, signaling pathway with a different mechanism, that could be very effective.